I see uh, lots of folks are coming to join us. So I think I'll just get started and um, others can join us as you enter. Um, so good afternoon. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on what I hope uh, where you are is also a bright and hopeful Monday morning. Um, so I'm sitting in Western Massachusetts. Um, we've got lots of folks joining us from all over, including campus in Northeastern, seeing some familiar faces here. Okay, great. I'm just checking in on Rebecca's message. Okay, great. So we've got some classes joining us as well. Wonderful. So hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Monday. I'm Amy Halliday, Director of the Center for the Arts here at Northeastern University. I'm also curator of Gallery 360, which is where we're currently showing the work of Fafna um, Adamitis um, and, uh, and Matthew Cummings in the exhibition Tracing Absence. So for those of you who are on campus, I encourage you to go and see that really beautiful tactile exhibition. Um, one of the through lines of that exhibition is how we render the invisible and often inequitable salient, uh, which is something that has really informed the shaping of today's conversation. I've been so privileged to work closely with and learn from each of today's speakers who've been so generous with their time and energy and engagement in difficult conversations. So having them speak to each other and to their practices just seemed like a natural expansion. And I'm really delighted to have them here today. So with that in mind, uh, let me introduce uh, today's speaker. I'm just seeing we've got wonderful participants uh, joining us every couple of moments here. Wonderful. Okay, so let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Fafna Adamitis is an artist from Western Mass, uh, where I'm actually based. And um, I've been really deeply moved by their work for several years. So I'm delighted to be doing the show with them at last. Uh, Fafna holds an MFA degree from the Fiber and Material Studies Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in Photography and Women's Studies from UMass Amherst, just around the corner. Uh, Fafna is currently a visiting assistant professor in the Fibers program at Indiana University Bloomington. They also teach at Snow Farm, the, the New England Craft Program and Women's Studio Workshop. And they live in the beautiful Turners Falls, Massachusetts. Ilya Vidrin is a performer, educator, and researcher at the intersection of performing arts, philosophy, and interactive media. Born into a refugee family, Dr. Vidrin's research and artistic practice interrogates the complex ethics of human interaction, including the embodiment of empathy, cultural competence, and social responsibility. He's an alum of Northeastern, where he pursued cognitive psychology and neuroscience. He completed graduate work in human development and psychology at Harvard University and a doctorate in performing arts at Coventry University in the UK. He's currently a postdoc in the theater department and I'm so glad our paths have crossed. So how the discussion will proceed today is that first Fafna and then Ilya will give us a brief introduction to their work as a grounding for the discussion. And then we'll chart our course through a few open-ended lines of inquiry. And at the end, we hope to have a little time for audience questions. And I know some of the students are, have um, come to the show and are really keen to ask questions. So feel free to put your question in the chat as we go along. And as you saw in the waiting room, if you would like to ask your question live, please add RTS or write to speak uh, with your question. Uh, so that's it from me and I'll hand it over to Fafna and I think Ilya is going to uh, share slides for us. Thank you so much for all being here. Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, my name is Fafner Adamitis. I am very happy to uh, talk about um, some of the work that's currently in the show um, that you can see on campus if you're a Northeastern student, um, and also a couple of other pieces that also um, work within the same concepts and some of the um, similar materials. Um, so if we can go ahead one slide. Excellent, thank you. So um, one of the series that's um, highlighted at the show is the Presence of Absence series. Um, so this series um, 
I made in 2019. And uh, one of the reasons I uh, kind of approached this work, um, it was very new work for me to work with hydrostone, um, which is a, a material very much like plaster. Um, it, my interest in it really um, was based in some of my early research and thinking about um, the history of textiles, um, the history of the roles of the people who uh, typ typically made textiles, um, and the uh, really difficult task of uh, finding uh, historic examples of textiles because of their ephemeral quality. Um, you can imagine a, a weaving or another material that's made out of either plant fibers or animal fibers, it biodegrades uh, very easily. So at, for instance, an archeological dig, um, it is uh, very unlikely to find a, a full weaving or a piece of clothing in comparison to something like uh, ceramic pottery. And one of the things that I discovered that, that really fascinates me is the, the fact that um, sort of the discovery of exactly, well, not exactly, but about how old textiles are um, really wasn't because of a, a fragment or a, a weaving in itself, um, but it was because of an imprint of a weaving on a piece of um, ceramic. So this series was really uh, trying to explore that idea of imprinting a material, um, imprinting an ephemeral material, a material that would break down into something that is much more long lasting. Um, so in this, I embedded a weaving that I made into the hydrostone. Um, and once the hydrostone dried, it took the, the imprint of the weaving and I um, kind of excavated that weaving out of the hydrostone. So it's just the, um, the imprint of the weaving, the memory of the weaving, but not the weaving itself. Um, so this, this idea of uh, bringing to light things that are um, not within your hands, things that are maybe hard to articulate, hard to place. Um, these were a lot of the ideas that I was working with. Um, with this series. So we could go ahead to the next slide. So the one element that really um, kind of goes throughout a lot of my work is um, certainly storytelling, um, but often it is the absence of information within the story that I am working with. So. For instance, in these two pieces, which are also in the show, um, in the gallery, these are two large scale weavings that were made with used t-shirts. Um, and so particularly in the piece on the left, a record of obscured meaning, um, I used only black t-shirts with white graphics or imagery on them. And through the process of the weaving, um, the images, the messages all get um, compacted um, so you don't have access to the information anymore. And I was really um, interested in this idea of kind of providing information, um, but the information isn't clear. It's not accessible. Um, certainly if you look close up to um, this weaving, you could see letters, you could see um, elements of design, but you're really prevented from seeing the full story. Um, and similarly in the piece on the right, Errant Approach, um, this one is much more minimal in terms of um, the amount of the white graphics or, or text that are included, um, but it has a, a extensive amount of surface stitching as well. Um, so not only am I kind of playing with this idea of removing information or um, kind of keeping information from the viewer, um, but I'm also trying to disrupt the real rigidity that is so common within a weaving. So if you think about a weaving, it's based on a grid, um, the uh, um, up and down, the left and right, they're, they're very uh, immovable in a lot of ways and very consistent. So um, a lot of my kind of trying to approach some of the subjects of things like inherited trauma, um, or um, stories that are not clear, information that is not clear. Um, I'm trying to get at that um, with a lot of this abstraction, um, removing information and obscuring things that are controlled or regular in some way. And we can go on to the next slide. 
So another way that I approach some of these ideas is um, outside of weaving and starting with that grid and then interrupting it in some way. Um, I, I do this, this a lot with felt making as well. Um, I do a lot of sculptural felt making um, as well as um, working with paper. And uh, for me, wool and paper are um, really particular materials to use um, because they start in a very chaotic form. I call them chaos structures. So in comparison to a weaving, which like I said, is very rigid in its grid formation, um, wool and paper start as a chaotic uh, mass of materials that through their process, um, and because of the way that I work with them, there's a shrinking process that's involved. That material um, creates a new uh, topography. It creates a new landscape um, and whatever material might be embedded with it or laid upon it um, while it's going through that shrinking process, that material is taken with it um, and shrunken as well and really transformed. So in this um, large scale piece that was installed in 2019, um, Interfere With, this is a, a large scale piece of uh, felted burlap and um, you get a hint of it in this picture, but the surface is very irregular. It's very wrinkled. Um, and if you can imagine the um, sort of stiffness of a, a typical um, length of burlap, the uh, felting process really had to be extremely physical and um, uh, to be able to transform that burlap into something different. So um, these are the, really regular kind of themes that I'm working with. I'm working with abstraction for sure, um, large scale pieces, pieces that um, kind of change an environment and affect an environment, um, and pieces that really uh, take up space within a gallery setting as well. Um, that's pretty important to me as a maker to have the work be in, impactful um, in material and surface, but as well as scale. So I think maybe I'll kind of wrap it up there. There's so much more. Obviously, I could I could talk for for ages about each one of these pieces, but um, in the interest of having the bigger conversation, I will I will hold my additional thoughts right there. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So jumping off of that thread of of where to start and where to dig into. My work as a choreographer really emerges from my experience of code switching. I grew up in a refugee family that was Soviet and Jewish, and I learned Hebrew, I learned Russian, I was learning English all at the same time, thinking about how to express myself, how to express my ideas. And, and I started dancing quite young. And I started in ballet and then moved to ballroom dancing and the relationship between bodies has always been really fascinating to me, as well as the relationship between languages. I got injured when I started to dance professionally, and that's what brought me to Northeastern. And I developed an interest in psychology, attention, perception, how it is that people understand each other and, and develop awareness of how they express themselves, how they perceive each other. And so the two pieces I want to talk about today, one is Otherwise, so this piece is a multidisciplinary production that investigates and responds to Soviet era bard music of oppression and hope through dance. I'm responding to the poetry of Bulata Kudrava and Vladimir Vysotsky. These are two poets who were censored in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union didn't have freedom of expression uh, or freedom of, of freedom of speech or freedom of religious ex expression. And so I have a lot of memories of my parents singing these songs with a distant look in their eye. And for a long time, I wanted to choreograph them, but couldn't quite figure out how to respond to this music and respond to choreography. So this piece really centers on this intergenerational trauma in, in my Soviet Jewish community. And the creative practice research explores movement and sound or music and dance and, and how they provide the tools for asking questions about social responsibility, about cultural competence, about ethics of care. The poetry feels incredibly relevant to me today. And it's interesting to 
understand the allegory and the figurative language because there wasn't freedom of speech. Uh, uh, these poets had to find ways of expressing themselves that wasn't directly calling things out. There's an interest for me of how these songs provide anchors or tethers for my family and for my community. To think about the trauma of immigration, the desire to stay, the fear of leaving. These ideas were pervasive in the Soviet Union, for my family at least, given the 16 republics and the ways in which there were, there were interactions happening at so many different levels. And I have so many stories of, of my parents who identify as Jewish, which was considered a nationality in the Soviet Union. So in their passport, even though they were born and raised in Leningrad, they they were Jews and, and denied particular access to things based on this nationality, even though they presented in a way that came off as very similar to others around them. So what's interesting to me is that a lot of these songs deal with the concept of authenticity, the concept of genuineness and to be able to find ways to express that allegory through dance through movement is is one of the key aspects of this piece another piece that i'm working on is called attunement or that which cannot be measured so this piece traces a quartet to young dancers to older dancers negotiating their physicality through improvisation. So I see this piece as a meditation on social ethics. As I see it, the piece challenges the performers to encounter and attune to each other in real time improvisationally. So even though there is a structure, the choreography isn't set. So it's really drawing on formal aspects of interaction like proximity, relative position, orientation, point of contact, tactility. The performer's work is to practice consent and, and to manifest care through their consensual receptivity. What I've been really fascinated by is that the possibility of harm is always present in physical interaction. So the quartet is continuously challenged to orient to each other with resilience. Like otherwise, attunement is also performed with live music. So while otherwise has live music that is an interpretation of these bard songs in a more contemporary way, attunement, the score for attunement is the Bach Chacon, the partita for solo violin, second partita for solo violin. So the piece begins with this wearable technology that's capturing these elements of proximity, orientation, and touch, things that are very palpable for the dancers, the, the robust kinesthetic experience that isn't always visible. And what happens is our interaction, our subtle movements are being synthesized into a notation system that's read by a live musician who deconstructs and plays with the Bach Chacon through transformations, fragmentations, and inversions. The violinist Daniel Kurganov adapts his interpretation. So through things like bow pressure and bow speed, we're able to play with interactive couplings between dancers, between the musician and the instrument, between the music and the sound, between the score and the interpretation. So throughout the whole piece, there's this question of how do we encounter each other? How do we interact with each other? How do we manage uncertainty? And how do we deal with these subtle, subtle attempts to practice care, to manifest care through our physicality and through our artistry? So I'm going to pause there too, because there's a lot more I can say about both of these pieces and other pieces, but I'm eager to get into this conversation. Well, thank you both so much for sharing a, a little bit of your practice just to kind of ground us in the work. Um, and we talked a little bit about some of the lines of inquiry we wanted to pursue that seemed to kind of thread through um, both of your works. And the first was really how both of you are interested in how we make ideas and experiences of trauma salient or palpable without direct representational narrative. And I think Fafna talked a lot about abstraction. We talked a lot about materiality and movement. So why do you think it's important to each of you 
um, to um, not use direct representation or a kind of linear narrative? And how would you say that that manifests in your practice? Well, for me, um, the approach to work in abstraction um, partly is an, it's an acknowledgement that something like trauma is a, um, it's not a, the memory of trauma is not a linear experience. Um, memory is not linear. Um, it's very hard to represent um, whether we're um, trying to find words for things um, that are kind of unexplainable. Um, that's a lot of the impulse for me. Um, it's also a way to not prescribe uh, too much detail to work um, that would be so uh, personal to me that it would make it hard for a viewer to uh, find their own place within it, to find a place for questioning, um, to find a place for um, their own their own memories, their own experiences. So um, it's a way to be transferable um, and a way to be, uh, um, yeah, to be not literal. Um, it's so it's so impossible to to tell a story of trauma um, and to um, be articulate about it. As I am right now, I feel like there's there's times where it's so it's so hard to be articulate about it because it's such um, it's such a, a chaotic experience, um, and it's chaotic to think about the. Um, traumas of people who came before you, if you're thinking about inherited trauma. Um, you know, I can't speak the words for my ancestors, my grandmother, um, whoever it might be. It's um, particularly hard to tell that story um, because it's not my story. Um, but the, uh, the feeling of inherited trauma is something that um, that kind of phantom emotional the leftovers, you know, from previous generations. It's hard to articulate that um, to people who don't have that experience, who don't um, physically or emotionally or spiritually feel that um, within themselves. Um, so I think that's another reason why um, abstraction, I think works really well to be able to begin the conversation about these things. I agree. I think one of the challenges with dance is that it is in some ways very easy to represent trauma just by putting people into a situation where they're interacting in ways that seem dangerous and that hasn't been an interest in my work is to is to put people in danger but to challenge them to understand the kinesthetic experience so as a dancer there's always this point of contention that dance seems like this visual art form and yet it's a kinesthetic one. So what the dancers experience physically is not always visible and yet the experience of it is robust. And so for otherwise, for example, the music that my parents sang to me or that I heard them singing, it wasn't always directly an experience of them singing to me. It was catching fragments of it and then looking it up and then learning these songs and singing them back to them, my experience hasn't always been met openly. I've had this conversation many times with my parents, with my grandparents, with others in the community who see what, what they experienced as an escape. So to hear these songs coming from my mouth to, to them in many ways has been triggering and they, they haven't been interested in this adaptation. And so figuring a way to grapple with it and say, these songs to me feel so deeply personal, so deeply meaningful, and yet have a very different sort of connotation for my parents. I, I played one of the new adaptation songs for my aunt who's in her seventies and she cried. I didn't realize that she hadn't heard this song in 40 something years. And to hear it come from my mouth was suddenly this like, Oh no no I don't no no we need to stop we I need to she had to leave the room and we had to change the topic of the conversation and and I see this piece both as a as a gift 
to give back to grapple with these deep questions and also as a challenge to heal as a challenge to come together and recognize that music and dance can offer something beyond the literal something beyond the representation something about the texture of the kinesthetic experience that has gone has has been embodied and yet largely perhaps and um importantly like there's a way to understand why it hasn't been grappled with so challenge and i think both of your responses actually really um illuminate something that laurie in the chat has just been mentioning um in relationship to her own research on second and third generation literature and, and memoir um, that there's these kind of dislocations between personal experience and, and inherited trauma and others' experiences. And I think both of you spoke really eloquently to how you're, you're working through that, but also other, others' perceptions or experiences within that. And it's not a speaking for. Um, and I also really love that point you, you brought up about maybe a, a difference between danger and discomfort, that while you don't want to reproduce or create conditions of, of, of danger and kind of precarity, there is an openness to discomfort as potentially um, a way towards healing or um, kind of new, new thought. Um, which actually brings me, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit around in our, in our question, initial question order, because I remember us talking about discomfort and, the, and our roles as educators. So I'd maybe like to take that thread through to um, one of the questions we had been discussing was how, as not only makers, but educators, um, those realms might inform one another. And um, so what is it that feels important for you to share with or model for your students as not only a maker, but an educator, whether that's this question of discomfort or, or many other things? Some of it for me is about being willing to be vulnerable with my students um, in order for them to feel comfortable to be vulnerable as well. Um, so, uh, being willing to talk about having artist block, you know, about, um, certainly since, um, the pandemic started having difficulty finding ways to be creative, um, and finding purpose in creativity, um, in the face of, um, a really chaotic world. Um, so, you know, that's, some of it is being able to share some of my experience in the studio. Um, and just as a as a maker to um, somebody who um, tries to grapple with hard subjects and not um, sort of shy away from them. I often have students who will bring up an idea for a project and immediately sort of discount themselves and say, oh, that's too dark or that's, I don't know, I can't, I should try to make something happier. And, you know, I love the dark stuff. <laughs> I love the stuff that, um, it, and it doesn't have to be negative content, um, but content that has some tooth to it, you know, content that helps the other students in the class learn about, you know, their classmate. Um, and some of those can be the most productive um, projects, I think, when, when students are willing to take risks. Um, and I definitely try to tell them about the own, you know, the risks that I've made in my studio or in my own um, sort of storytelling as well. I, I also agree. I think there's, there's a way to scaffold vulnerability, a way to scaffold risk taking. And both of these, both of these pieces for me represent a, a sort of new direction. So I feel very privileged and, and grateful to have received the training in, in dance and music that I was able to receive. And for a long time, the work that I was making was in a sort of classical or contemporary lineage, responding to balletic or, or neoclassical work. And being able to take on this subject matter now felt incredibly important and incredibly relevant. And I've been documenting my process as I go that there's a very big fear of being misunderstood within my community, that in my community, I'm American. I grew up in this country and so I speak English, I have no accent. So 
I should just go with that and assimilate and be American. And yet to my American friends, my name is Ilya. I'm not, you know, some people say I have an accent. I, I'm, the questions that I'm asking are born of my experience. And so there's a way in which I've felt like I'm unable to move forward as an artist until I grapple with these questions internally and try and make sense of them. And as an educator, I think that's important because I can start to look at what has been a barrier for me to engage with this process. What has been a barrier creatively? What has been a barrier personally? What has been a barrier artistically? And I feel with my, so in the spring, if there are students, I'm, I'm teaching a class called Ethics and Creative Practice, which is primarily geared at trying to ask these questions together to, to try and grapple with what is our responsibility as artists to understand ourselves, to make sense of our experience? Do we have a responsibility? Is that a virtuous thing to do? Is that an obligation that we take on? Is that part of our agreement as artists? Or is that just something that we can choose to understand on our own? And to what degree can we abstract things, make them literal? These are our questions that we can and do grapple with as creative practitioners. So as Coming back to the question as an educator, I think it's important to be able to name them and at least say, I'm very drawn to this. I don't know why, and I'm scared of it, but I recognize that my fallback is to listen to these songs or my full fallback is to watch this thing. And th that seems to be an important starting point, an important entry point into getting deeper into process. Yeah, so... I think uh, not only as educators, um, I, I'm just thinking about your description of your spring class, um, which is very kind of philosophically oriented, I'd say, with these kind of questions of ethics and care. Um, but linked to these kind of philosophical questions, one of them that I think really threads through both, uh, both of your practices is this idea of investigating questions of knowledge. So how do we know and understand the world? How do we know and understand our experience, our relationship to ourselves and others? So it's kind of like, you know, epistemological questions. So I think the bigger question we have here, and this is something that we talk a lot in about in the College of Arts, Media and Design, is this question of how might creative practice further our knowledge and how could we track or articulate those methodologies, these kind of systems of knowing and unknowing which I think is to a lot of folks who consume art or who, who watch or participate, um, maybe don't think about them in terms of methodologies or, or ways of knowing. Um, so how do you think creative practice can really further our knowledge and how can we track and articulate those, those methodologies? I don't know who wants to go first. I could, I could start, I don't mind. Um... So uh, there, there's a lot to that for sure. So in the, the topic of knowledge, of knowing, of, I, I think about intuition a lot um, as both as a human and as a maker. Um, and I think that that's something that is really important to talk about in the classroom um, about people trusting their in instincts or trusting their impulses um, with what they're making or what they're drawn to, but also being willing to dig into that further to understand why that impulse is there or why, why they're drawn to certain things. Um, that certainly started a lot of the in investigations in my studio about why I was so drawn to repetitive processes, um, why I was so drawn to uh, um, particular materials that had this real embedded history. Um, so uh, intuition, I think, is, is a big part of that. And, and certainly going, you know, bringing it back to the idea of inherited trauma also. Um, if you're a person who is faced with that, you know, that idea or that theory, it could be a, a real point of tension between thinking about like a path that's been laid out for you already, um, particular traits or reactions that are kind of built into your system, and then what you are willing to do with that knowledge. You know, do you follow that same path? Do you let those impulses take over? Um, or do you uh, 
you know, meditate on those, understand where those are coming from, and then find um, a new path or a path that's parallel or, you know, something that is more your own. So uh, I'm not sure if that's really answering the question, but that's the, the first place that I go to in thinking about that. Thinking about questions of knowledge always brings me back to code switching and, and to textures of knowing or textures of understanding. So an anecdote I often bring up when I when I came to Harvard, I my first advisor was the the late Kurt Fisher, who was an amazing thinker, an amazing, he was an amazing advisor. I came to him and said that I wanted my thesis project to be about improvisational dance and the relationship between improvisational dance and self-awareness or self-knowledge. And he looked at me, he sort of smiled and he said, you know, this is a this is a psychology and neuroscience program. So it's great that you want to be a dancer, but you really have to focus on the em empirical questions here. So I left for a month did some deep digging and thinking and I came back and I said, okay, I want to study the effect of sensory motor development on interoceptive awareness. And he said, great. And I said, great. I just said the same thing, but using a different language. So finding a way to articulate things linguistically is one way of knowing. But what I often tell my dancers, what I often tell my students is that I don't really see a hierarchy in, in ways of understanding. I see textures. So through dance, through music, we're able to understand something else, something, something else. I don't want to say something deeper. I don't want to say something more. It's just a different texture. And developing the ethics and creative practice class for the spring, it was very important to me that the class is hybrid. So half the time we're going to be reading in, in seminar and discussing ethical theories, deontology, virtue, utilitarianism, and so on. And half the time we're going to be in studio, we're going to be, we're going to be practicing. And I'm looking forward to challenging my students to move and to make and the discomfort of creation, the, this, the discomfort of managing uncertainty, to be able to dive into that creative process to then say, okay, I'm stuck. And then how do we manage uncertainty? How do we manage the that, that process of not knowing what else or not knowing what to do. So I'm I was loving the, the kind of slippage that I'm noticing between kind of text and texture and textile um, and the, the way we move between those. I think texture is such a wonderful way to describe um, elements of both of your practice that goes really beyond the visual or the kind of aesthetic. Um, both of your practices kind of move in so many different modalities, which is a part of why I am obsessively telling everyone to go to the gallery and see uh, Fafner's work in person, for example, because there is something so different about that embodied experience and relationship to it uh, than I think just, you know, seeing, a, seeing a, an image reproduced. Um, so thinking about those questions, though, of what is um, seen or unseen, um, as I was just mentioning, I think to a viewer or an audience, um, both of your works are incredibly compelling and, and, and often deeply beautiful, um, which in and of itself might lead someone astray um, or lead them into interesting places, but they're incredibly compelling, visually, kinesthetically, uh, spatially, sonically, yet what kind of undergirds uh, both of your practices is a lot of um, unseen tension, a lot of unseen labor. There's a lot of kind of um, struggle within, behind, or beneath the, the beautiful surface. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about this dialogue between what's seen and received in the final piece and what is part of your personal or private practice and process. Um, is there a moment at which you articulate that? Is that only for you? Um, how much do we need to know of that to kind of access it? In, uh, within the world of people who work with fiber materials, um, there is often a, uh, a discussion, a tension about whether or not work can be touched um, when it's within a gallery. Um, and that's part, um, so that's something that um, is coming up for me while, while we're talking about this. I'm, uh, I hate it when people touch my work. I discourage it. I will slap my friend's hand away, <laughs> you know, if they reach out to touch it. 
Um, and I'm really denying a certain amount of understanding because of that. Um, and there, it's, it is a, a big discussion about whether or not someone should touch a weaving or a paper piece, these things that are so ephemeral and that are so affected by, you know, the oils in your hands or repeated touch could soften and change, you know, the surface or a shape of something. So um, already with the materials that I'm using um, and my um, rigidity about not letting people touch the work, I'm, I'm already preventing a certain amount of understanding. Um, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, but I think that that's part of what, um, yeah, I think that's part of the tension of this. And certainly as uh, the maker, I am uh, putting myself through often really uh, physically difficult, repetitive motions to make this work. Um, felt making large scale paper, um, pieces, the weavings, um, it takes repetitive motion, it takes so much physicality. And that's all, um, to me, I consider that a real private performance. That's something that I do within my studio. I don't like other people to be in my studio. Um, I don't have assistants who work with me to make these pieces. Um, and it's a real physical struggle in a lot of cases. Um, it feels like a necessity for me to go through all of that physical work myself because it's part of the meditation on the ideas. Um, it's part of me um, physically going through that process. Um, so it is a, a personal aspect of the work. And I know that if you are, if a viewer enters a gallery and doesn't really understand the mechanics of, of making a weaving or the process of doing these things that a certain amount of the, the impact is lost. Um, and that is also a struggle as well um, as someone who shows in galleries, um, how much information do you give um, to be able to let people into the process and have them understand all of those intricacies because that process is definitely part of it for me. That, um, that part of the making is, is so much part of it. Um, but not everyone is kind of privy to that information. It's actually, it's interesting that you say that, um, you know, how much people can access immediately because I think, and I know um, my co-op Avery's on here on the call as well. We thought a lot about how to install, um, particularly the record of obscured meaning. So those of you who were here earlier, we, um, we I don't think we actually saw a, a large picture of that, but that piece is in fact, uh, is that 25 feet, 30 feet? 25 um, feet. 25 feet. Um, so this piece is 25 feet long. And so there's not only the unseen labor that goes into any work of this type, of this kind of making, but just the kind of immense scale of it. Um, and so part of our decision making around how to hang that work was, ca can we bring some aspect of this to the fore? And so we actually decided to hang it in such a way that it, it hangs as if cascading down in a kind of uh, immense, overwhelming waterfall effect. Um, it's as if it's kind of like a waterfall of binary code or like something coming out of a dot matrix printer. Or I, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around it, but it then kind of hits um, a platform and goes horizontally. So you also see it as this thing that you can read over time, almost durationally, as you have to kind of navigate it in space. You can't really take it in all at once. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's also interesting to think about how curatorially one can try to um, render something of that visible, but that whole really, that process behind that, that you've gone through um, of making of, of labor, which I'm sure is a very heightened um, and emot emotional process as well, is not one that we curatorially can render um, as easily. Um, so um, Ilya, do you want to um, add to that? I think it's one of the sort of cliches in dance that if you tell people you're a dancer, they'll say something like, oh my God, that's so much fun. You get to do some, like you get to spend your life doing things that are fun. And it's always this sort of cliche of like, yes, there's more going on in dance than having fun and more going on in dance than being entertaining. And that's a sort of obvious place to start. I think about private practice these days pretty often, obviously because of the pandemic, and also because going into a PhD as a dancer is 
a sort of strange thing to do. And I find that there's a lot that goes into the work. And to be just vulnerably candid, I find that I always want to sort of offer people the whole thing. Here's a guide to how to read this work so that you're not just lost when you come into it. Halfway through every process, I have a total meltdown of thinking that no one's going to understand what I'm doing. And the, the threshold for dance is often, you know, so I think you can dance or dancing with the stars. And my work doesn't look like that. So there's a question of, of how to scaffold and how to prime and what goes into the private practice for me and my partners here somewhere is really how we relate to each other and how do we practice relating to each other so that what's put on stage is a product of that deep practice of relating. And then I often see also my work as meditative because it's asking people to sink into this way of relating that I have ideals, I have, a, I have an idea of how I want my audience to take in the work. And often it's a challenge. It's, it's going to invite people not to just passively consume the dance, but to try and dig deeper into it. And so there's always this sort of round problem of what is it that went into getting your leg to a certain height or getting you to turn or jump in a certain way that that is a product of training. And, and that's, that's one idea of virtuosity, but there are other ideas of virtuosity and how we express care and how we manifest respect and so on, how those ethics in our process become salient, become tangible, even if they're not necessarily visible, they're robust as a feeling. And I've been really tied to one of the reasons in otherwise that I'm tied to this essentially folk movement is because many of these poets weren't musicians. So what they were able to achieve in their musicality wasn't a product of musical training, but a product of trying to manifest some feeling into words and then into sound. And the standard by which we take in folk music is very different than the standard by which we take in something like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? We're not really looking at people to play the notes exactly at the right time, exactly correctly. We're looking at the way in which this feeling is being expressed and whether we can relate to it. And the other challenge is the sentimentality so that it doesn't sort of fall apart into the sickly sweet feelings, whatever that might mean. So, so drawing on what Fafni was saying earlier about intuition, there's a way in which there is a negotiation happening and there's a challenge to be able to convey it in its complexity rather than reduce it into binaries or, or minimalistic simplicities. And I'm, I'm also thinking from what you're saying about this, like, these ideas of um, ethics, reciprocity, um, that there's also a role here for the viewer, I think. Um, and this comes out very strongly in Fafner's work, but I'm thinking also in terms of the kind of the gaps and the, um, the possibilities kind of inherent in, in your work also, Ilya, um, that there is a role for the active, the active in, um, engaged viewer as someone who's involved in the role of interpretation, that this thing is not resolved or fixed. Um, and that there is some part of the process that is completed or at least continued in the mind and experience of the of the viewer. So I would encourage those of you who are on campus to see, for example, um, the, the presence of absence work, um, which is this large scale installation made up of fragments that could have been differently arranged. Um, and that was a really interesting relationship too, to have this kind of curatorial freedom to take all of these pieces and uh, to arrange them, maybe show one, maybe show 33, uh, and to arrange them as we wanted to. And we created a kind of space that you move into, but that you really have to actively negotiate. Um, so with that in mind, I think I'm gonna pass this over to questions. And I know we had a question from Alex. So Alex, I'm gonna um, ask you to unmute if you'd like to ask your question live. 
Sure. So, hi everyone. My name is Alex. Um, so, I really enjoyed the uh, the discussion of ethics and creative practices, and I was curious about um, what do you think the relationship between philosophy and art is? Coming from someone who's very interested in in both, I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Right. So. I think this is obviously a product of having done a PhD in philosophy, but I, I see my artistic practice as philosophy. I, I see my, my work asks questions and is meant to ask generative questions. So often what I tell my students or my dancers, my collaborators, is that we're not trying to solve any problems. We're trying to make these things salient and visible. And my PhD advisor was an epistemologist, so obviously I'm super drawn by or drawn to philosophy and philosophy of antiquity I've found particularly relevant because Plato draws a distinction between Thauma and Eros between that which is awe-inspiring and that which is soul-stirring and I've always sort of been drawn to this distinction of how we can inspire wonder and say you know when you watch dance you can say something like oh my god I could never do that or that's amazing or you can watch dance and say, I wanna do that. I want to move in this way too. And as a research practitioner, performance philosopher, choreographer, whatever identity of the day it is, I am drawn to this, to creating experiences where people want to relate to it and say, I want, I want more of this. I want to engage with this rather than sit back and be like, wow, I didn't know humans could do that that's sort of the opposite sort of effect that I want to achieve. With my work, I don't think about, or I wouldn't um, necessarily identify philosophy as a place, um, like an origin point for my work, y yet it is. Um, I, I certainly think about uh, things like psychoanalysis, um, maybe more than I do philosophy, but, um, but certainly research that, that I've done and um, like thinking about some ideas of Deleuze and Guattari, thinking about the smooth and the striated, um, which is so specifically about um, fiber materials, about the woven striated space versus the smooth felt space um, and the possibilities within that. Um, I think that that is, um, it makes a lot of sense to think about materials in that way and thinking about the um, embedded meaning or the potential meaning in materials and um, spaces that are created um, using materials and what those um, what those can say. Um, so uh, that's my feeling. I, I have I've always had mixed feelings about philosophy with like a capital P um, because I've always had a feeling that there wasn't a, a space there for me. Um, I think in the in my education, um, philosophy has been so much about male figures um, speaking about the experiences of other people. Um, that has always been a sticking point for me. Um, that's maybe a much larger conversation, <laughs> but that's one of the immediate things that, that I think about. So I think we're coming to the, the end of our hour together. I'd love to just um, maybe ask you one last thought, which is just to share um, what you're working on right now or where we can see what you're working on, what is exciting you, where next, um, just to kind of leave us all with a little bit of something that, oh, sorry. Okay, so Rebecca Moore has a quick question. So let's, uh, let's let Rebecca join in. Rebecca, can we, can we put you live or do you want to ask it? Okay, yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are with your whole class. Great. Hi, they're all here. I mean, this is sort of a apologies, Fefner, for the textile reference, but this is a well-worn question um, already in 2020. But um, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect in this in this particular discussion because uh, we this is a class focused on management of music organizations, which might not seem quite re uh, relevant to your work, but in fact, very much is because. We're spending this module talking about our relationship to people and um, particularly to artists and the ethics of those relationships and um, the ways in which our management practices can be uh, can be further uh, uh, inclusive and further. And, and so 
Ilya, ever since we've met, I've been thinking about that concept of the ethics of care and how that might inform my own teaching and how this might inform you know, this classroom's approach to management in the future. But I'm also, we've, we've been struggling with imagining what any of this is, is, is looking like or will look like anytime soon. And with the practice of live music being so essential to not only our sort of MO, but, but really our you know, bread and butter and our, our just the desire to, <laughs> to be in this program and to engage as artists, I'm just wondering, because uh, so much is already unseen in the process and so much is um, uh, sort of unknown without being in the, in the dancer's body in your work, what now in this, this Zoom space that you find yourselves in, um, what sort of, yeah, just how are you feeling in being in these sorts of spaces for extended periods of time? I mean, is this the time where you go back to that private practice and, and the studio time? Um, and if so, how do you how do you continue to connect outside with with others who would who are really missing seeing your work in person? Yeah, Sorry, that was not a short question. <laughs> so my my partner just popped up, but I, I'm very lucky to have a partner who we share a private practice, and it's I mean the pandemic has been challenging in many ways, and being able to have, I mean, what I've said, I think almost on a daily basis over the past seven or so months is how do we keep the flame alive? And understanding that my work is deeply relational, deeply, it's about connection, human connection through tactility, through kinesthesis that Zoom really troubles and disrupts. And, and in many ways it's been, okay, how do we adapt to this environment? But really, how do we keep the flame alive of live music and live dance? So to pair Amy's question with Rebecca's question, Jesse and I are going to be teaching workshops through the new museum, which is where part of this work attunement has been commissioned to be able to share how to continue practicing tactility, continue practicing kinesthetic awareness while sitting on a chair, while leaning on a table while opening a door. And the musicians that I've been very lucky to work with over the last few months, we've been creating an album that we're excited to share. So there are aspects of the work that do live in a virtual space, but really it's been asking those higher order questions of, of when we practice privately, when we orient to an instrument, when we orient to objects, as subjects, so we've been working on a little workshop called Subjects of Care, where we're really investigating and investing in the practice of care and respect, maybe not to other humans because of physical distancing protocols, but still trying to find ways to physically interact. I don't have an answer to your question. It's a short answer, but through my short ramble there, I have been asking these questions of how can we continue to keep the flame alive? And I think that question needs to be continued to be asked because the Zoom space is opening up questions of accessibility and, and questions of continued support. And we need to keep the flame alive because live music and live dance are meant to be experienced together. And I think we can continue to be creative in our private practices to be able to offer opportunities for manifesting care and respect in in real in real time with real people. Yeah, I think I've been um, certainly affected by the amount of time that I'm on Zoom in any given day. Um, it doesn't feel natural to me at all to um, connect with people in this way. Though at the same time, I've been able to connect with people all over the world um, over the past few months through conferences I've attended, um, talks I've, I've attended or given. Um, it is such a, it's such a hard thing because it, um, to me, I find it extremely draining um, to stare into the screen for, for this long. And certainly as a, as a teacher um, and someone who teaches um, such process work, such tactile work, um, it makes it really difficult to not be 
Um, even in a classroom where we're physically distanced, it's so hard to not be like sitting side by side with someone. And even in some cases, like holding their hands in a particular position um, to be able to understand how a tool works or how a, a process can flow easier. Um, there's so many barriers in the kind of the, the natural way that I usually exist in that way. Um, but um, yeah, I don't really, I don't have an answer either in a lot of ways. Um, I think just trying to stay connected um, in any way we can. Um, I, um, in terms of work um, that I have, for, you know, on view right now, other than the work that's up in the gallery at Northeastern, I do have um, work in two online shows, one that's called Post Pause, um, which was curated by Maggie Nowinski and highlights um, Western Mass artists um, making work since the pandemic. Um, and then also the Surface Design Association, um, which I'm a board member of um, that really wonderful association around fiber and textile work. Um, they have an online show right now called Archive, which I'm a part of. Um, so those are two uh, virtual opportunities to see my work, but it's, it's not the same as being in a gallery. Um, it's very hard to, uh, um, it's hard to, to bring work like that across um, when it's so much about scale and texture and surface um, and the experience of being in a room um, and exploring the work like Amy was talking about earlier, um, the way that your body has to move around a gallery to see a piece and to bend over and to look closely, you know, all those things are so lost. Um, even with the best photography, you, you can't have the same experience, so. Um, yeah, and I'm going to jump in with two things to say, uh, Ilya, I don't know if you'd mind adding in the um, uh, chat the piece you did about partnering and synchronicity versus complementarity and this idea of Zoom being not the same, but not nothing, um, which was really um, formative in my thinking early on in the pandemic as someone who works so closely with artists and is so deeply invested in these embodied uh, and direct engagements with, with art. Um, and then I also wanted to mention just for the students and for Rebecca asking that question, I think this idea of an ethics of care um, as a cultural practitioner is also about thinking um, even as these challenges beset the makers, the dancers, the, 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 these, these folks among us, it is to think about what kinds of platforms can we create? What kind of different spaces can we make for those conversations for hap to happen, for those works to be shown? And I think there is a lot of room for innovation, um, whether it's something like um, recently I was involved in a, in a drive-in for video art, for example. So creating a huge space where people could safely gather to watch video art, for example. Or maybe it's inviting artists to be in your classes so that we can find ways of paying people to do, uh, to do the work that they do, but in, in different, you know, in different um, uh, on different platforms. So just thinking a lot also as not only as the artists, but those who are involved in the networks of support and circulation, what are the creative ways that, that we can kind of speak into that space? Uh, so we've been working a lot on 3D spaces, like 3D immersive tour, uh, tours where you can kind of zoom in and things like that. Definitely not the space, but not nothing. Um, you know, so it's not the same but it's not nothing. So I'm aware that we're just over one and we will um, stay a little bit on if our speakers don't mind just to answer one or two more questions, but we understand some of you may have to go if your lunch break is up. Um, but yeah, just to Rebecca, if your students wanna chat more about this, thinking about ways that we can all participate in supporting these kind of cultural ecosystems at this moment, I'm happy to do that. So we have questions from Emmett and then Jesse. So I will let each of you ask your own questions. We'll just um, unmute you and we'd love to hear from you. And those who have to go, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I am. Emmett, we were getting some feedback there. You want to try again? All good? Mm. No. Hello. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's good. better. Perfect. OK. Um, sorry about that. I'm also in Professor Moore's classroom, so there's a little bit of a feedback loop with that. Um, yeah, so my question is regarding um, the, I really liked the conversation regarding ethics and different interpretations on the art, especially with Ilya's 
uh, family, not, I don't want to say not supporting, but having a different reaction to the art. And I'm wondering where both of you stand on um, sort of separating the art from the artist, and especially in the cases of problematic artists. Do you think it's possible to reconcile um, a subjective a subjective interpretation to art that the viewer is allowed to apply their own meaning to while simultaneously being able to look at the artists who created it and their intention while creating the art. We were just talking about that earlier about Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling. Just just before this started and actually, Catherine, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, to me, it's a difficult task to separate the maker from what they do. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to think of an articulate way to say this. I, I don't personally, I wouldn't wanna be separated from the work that I produce, I think who I am, my experiences, my knowledge, my embodied knowledge, all of those things are so a part of my decision-making in what I do. Um, so I don't, I don't see a productive, I don't see it as a productive task. I don't, I don't see, and I'm, the reason I'm hesitating too is because we were talking about this earlier and we were talking about how do you separate um, a problematic person with art that you like. You know, if you learn that, I mean, uh, I'm sure many of us have had this experience over the past few years, whether it was uh, with the Me Too movement or other instances where um, the actions of uh, bad people have come to light. And then how do you, uh, how do you reconcile your love of their movies or their music or whatever it is. Um, I am still trying to figure that out because there's, there's uh, people who I have in the past really admired and then have learned about their actions. And I have stopped consuming their product, whatever that is, whether it's comedy or movies. Um, and I think it's, um, something that I need to do as a consumer to support the people who I believe in. Um, I may be going off on a tangent now with this, but um, that's why I want to approach that, that question. I think keeping with the theme that it is very difficult to separate them, but a fruitful task I've found in my own practices is, is to determine what kind of questions the artist is asking and how those questions become apparent in the work itself and whether those questions become apparent in the work itself. I know a lot of artists who have created problematic art. I know a lot of beautiful art that has been created by problematic artists. And have, I mean, we, we also can't forget things that we've taken in and some things have been so influential that they become a part of us. So I do think being able to tease apart the questions, and this is this is part of you know teaching philosophy 101 is like when we look at those older white male philosophers, they were wrong about many, many things. And those questions that they asked are important to consider so that we don't ask the same question in the same way, so that we can move forward from them and recognize the ways in which our thinking has been flawed historically. Personally, I feel like if we don't grapple with those questions, then we'll fall into the trap of asking them and answering them in the same way. So when we come across art in our own lives, I'm always encouraging my own students to, to try and tease out the questions that are being asked. And if something is drawing you to artwork that is made problematically or beautiful artwork or problematic artwork that has been made thoughtfully, what is it that is drawing you? What is it that's deterring you? And that might be, you know, a better question than whether, whether it is good art or bad art, why is it functioning in the way it's functioning for you? And can you articulate that? 
Um, something I very much learned from Ilya is the importance of asking better questions and questions leading to questions, not always um, incredibly resolved answers. Um, and I think I think that's very much what what um, both of your practices do is is help us to articulate really important questions. Um, I think there is one last question, um, and so I want to invite Jesse uh, to ask that um, before we wrap up. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back to this idea of trauma, where it seems like this conversation all started from. Um, you know, it seems like often in talking about the relationship between art and trauma, there is this narrative painted uh, about the artists and about artwork um, that kind of revolves around this idea of the suffering artists that almost frames trauma to be a condition for art or for good art or meaningful work. And so I'm just curious in um, each of your work, either personally or maybe just broad um, opinions about this relationship, what do you see to be uh, the relationship between trauma and art? Does trauma act as a catalyst? Um, and what might be dangerous about claims like this and the work that you're making? I think something to consider is whether the artist realizes um, that they work from a place of trauma or not, and whether they inflict that trauma <laughs> on other people. Um, I think it's a it's a certainly a starting point for many people to work through whatever issues, experiences, um, memories that they have. I can, I mean, certainly it's it's what's driven a lot of my work is my personal experience. Um, but something that may be a different approach between different artists is how they are um, working through that trauma or just working from within it. Um, if I could make that, you know, continue to try to make that distinction, um, you know, trauma could be um, considered a very dark, um, aggressive place to be working from. Um, and something that I try to really get across when I talk about my work is that it's not, I actually see this as a very hopeful place to be working from. Um, hopeful in that, I, like personally, I am going towards those hard subjects and grappling with them. I think grappling is, is really the, the word of the day for us. Um, it's about doing that work and finding the new, uh, the new language, the new movement, the new landscape. Um, certainly um, speaking for myself, the, the inherited trauma, the personal trauma that will always be there. Um, but it's, it's like what I, what I choose to do with it, um, what I choose to learn from it um, and uh, the conversations that can be born from that, that experience or that starting point. I think this question is interesting because I'm not sure how to respond. How how trauma fuels anything, I think, is a difficult framing because on the one hand, we, we have the data now to look back over the history of art and try and make claims about who has been successful, but there are plenty of artists that didn't make it so that we don't, we don't know what their process was or, or we don't know much about them. And what I've thought about so much coming back to Rebecca's question is the space between what is made visible, who it's made visible for, the, the, the relationship of what might be considered as community art or community art making and that which is trying to make you know, more general or more universal claims. And I think that's where the danger is, is that our experience of trauma is, is going to be subjective. And, and there are points of relationship. There, there are points in which, you know, we can read Romeo and Juliet and experience a sort of trauma and hope that we never experience that in real life, but we learn something from reading it. 
which is which is different than making sense of our own trauma and making sense of that experience. So I think there's a danger in trying to simplify it or trying to linearize it. There's a danger in trying to represent it. There's also something productive in trying to see it from a different angle. And this is where I think the creative arts can offer that sort of indirect experience. I can recall tension. I can recall misunderstanding. I can recall points of uncertainty and that can all be articulated in manifold ways. And so if we can use those, if we can make sense of that in a way from which we can then move forward to ask more generative questions, to relate to each other, to attempt to relate to each other, then we're entering into some kind of ethical territory. Without getting into a long ramble, I think it's fascinating when we take some deep ethical theory and ask questions about obligations and commitments and responsibilities and duties and whether we as artists take those on knowingly, whether we take those on, whether we consent to those kinds of obligations, whether we're aware that as artists, we have something that we are responsible for either in our work or how our work is disseminated. And now, given the fact that we have this Instagram culture and this visual culture, there's a, there's a tricky point of contention of how, how we navigate the things that are invisible and why we need to gather together because if we're just consuming it, then we're missing so many levels of it. It's part of my, my work as a collaborative maker is to get people to come together, experience something and then, and then engage with it and then discuss it or experience it in as many ways as we can. Thank you so much um, to everyone who joined us today and for your wonderful questions, but mostly to our wonderful um, artists here today for sharing your, your practice, your processes, um, your thoughts and insights with us. And just for that generosity um, in, in everything that you do. And that's been something that's been such a guiding process in, in how um, I have experienced working with you. And so I'm so grateful for that. And thank you for expanding that into this in the space and inviting so many other people into it today. So thank you everybody for joining us. I have um, put a couple of links in the chat if you'd like to know more about their work, about the Gallery 360 exhibition and about the Center for the Arts. Uh, we'd love to um, speak with you and have you join us for future events. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.